In our last talk, we introduced the concept of how um, pretty much any abnormal opacity in the lung can be explained by one of four reasons. And through the next couple of talks, we're going to discuss the interpretation and diagnosis and management of each of these types of opacities. We're going to start with nodules and masses. Uh, when we're talking about the um, interpretation and the management of nodules and masses, we're going to break these folks down into two buckets, nonspecific ones and specific ones. Nonspecific nodules and masses are ones where the imaging features are not specific for diagnosis, which means we'll often have to rely on follow-up imaging um, or sometimes even more invasive tests like biopsy to come to a conclusion. Specific nodules are different. Um, specific nodules and masses are highly specific um, on their kind of um, on imaging um, so that we can usually um, diagnose what we're looking at uh, without needing to resort to follow-up imaging or other tests. Um, for example, if you see a nozzle with uh, large blood vessels coming and going from it, um, you can be pretty certain it's a pulmonary AVM. For this talk, we're going to focus on um, the first bucket, non-specific nozzles and masses. And these are by far uh, more commonly encountered in our daily practice than specific ones. When it comes to um, managing um, these folks, these non-specific nozzles and masses, um, our top priority is to make sure we catch the malignant ones. Um, we're going to be um, influenced by a number of factors um, over, um, in terms of imaging features of these nodules um, in trying to decide um, what to do and how soon to do it. Um, size is one of those features, and it's important to understand what the literature and evidence basis um, suggests. Um, what I've uh, sh um, illustrated here are a number of uh, retrospective studies by a few different um, authors. Um, looking at um, different uh, nodule sizes groups and the likelihood of malignancy. <clears throat> if you uh, look at the, um, the few um, uh, examples on the left side of this slide by Swenson, Diederich, Benjamin, and Henschke, um, the take-home message basically is, is that the pretest uh, probability of uh, subcentimeter nodules uh, for malignancy is, is quite low. Um, the way we've drawn these um, little bars here in color, uh, for in the example of Swenson, um, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that uh, Swenson was looking at nozzles from zero to seven millimeters in size. And for that um, kind of group of nozzles, he observed a 0.1% malignancy rate. Um, on the other hand, if you look at, say, uh, the way we've drawn the bars here for Henschke et al., um, Henschke uh, looked at two buckets of subcentimeter nozzles. Um, for the uh, zero to six millimeter uh, nozzles, um, she reported a zero percent malignancy um, incidence, and for the six to ten millimeters, uh, she observed a six percent um, malignancy rate. On the other extreme, um, to the right of this chart, um, is a um, um, uh, data from uh, Zuhuni. Um, in Zuhuni's case, uh, they looked at basically uh, masses, effectively things over thirty millimeters, and you can see that the uh, malignancy rate is quite different than at the other the earlier um, um, left side of this uh, chart here, 94% um, malignancy rate for masses over 30 um, millimeters. So what's a TLDR? Um, basically, the smaller the nodule, the more likely um, it's benign. And these are the kind of numbers we're seeing. Now, um, this other um, <clears throat> set of data um, from Erasmus um, is interesting. Um, what he did was uh, he looked at benign nodules and malignant nodules and looked at what their sizes were. And uh, what this basically, uh, the takeaway message here is that uh, we have to be careful. Um, even though the, uh, the pretest probability of cancer in small nodules, subcentimeter nodules, is very low, um, small size alone does not absolutely exclude lung cancer. So in his study, 15% um, of malignant nodules were less than one centimeter. And 42% of uh, malignant nodules were um, less than two centimeters. Um, one other thing to kind of uh, kind of point out is this uh, large gap uh, between 10 millimeters and 30 millimeters um, on this slide. The pretest probability of nodules in the 10 to 30 millimeter um, kind of um, zone um, is not super low, like 1% or something, and it's not super high, like 94%. It's highly variable and um, highly dependent on clinical history. So it's one of those things where uh, we can't really um, 
um, tell what the malignancy risk is of nozzles in this um, kind of um, range without some context. Final slide um, um, is just a illustration that's a little different than the previous uh, couple of slides. Um, the data for the previous slides were all in patients without a history of cancer. And this is a slide uh, looking at uh, the, um, I guess, the incidence of cancer in nodules of different sizes in patients with a cancer history. And the number um, I think we want to focus on is in the light blue here uh, in terms of Wallace's uh, paper. Uh, Wallace looked at uh, nozzles in the 0 to 10 millimeter category. Um, if we look back a few slides, so recall that those numbers were very, very low um, in patients. And the numbers for um, malignancy um, risk were very, very low. Um, in patients with a cancer history, uh, substantially higher rates. Um, so what's the TLDR here? Um, the risk of malignancy skyrockets, even for these sub-centimeter lung nozzles, in patients who have a known malignancy. So that's size. Uh, next item, lung nozzle density. So um, when we uh, look at and describe the density of a lung nozzle, um, we tend to um, categorize them in terms of one of three uh, density um, types. Solid nozzles, um, ground glass or quote-unquote non-solid lung nozzles, which are basically kind of see-through, and then part solid lung nozzles, which have both ground glass and solid components. It's not uncommon to refer to part solid and pure ground glass nozzles together as subsolid. So you'll hear the term subsolid used too. Um, this is an interesting um, um, slide in terms of uh, data presented by Henschke um, almost 20 years ago now. <clears throat> and what Henschke did was looked at uh, lung nozzles and masses of different size from 0 to 45 millimeters and divide them into solid part solid and ground glass um, categories, and then reported the malignancy rate in each of these. The take home message here was um, looking at part solid and ground glass nozzles um, in terms of their malignancy rate compared to solid nozzles um, was, was interesting. Um, the rate of malignancy was actually substantially higher um, than nozzles of the same size that were solid. Um, these often tend to be uh, more indolent, um, lower grade adenocarcinomas though. Um, these are the type of cancers that uh, don't grow quite as rapidly or as aggressively as the ones we may encounter that look solid. Um, these are also cancers that as a consequence require us to follow up a lot longer uh, than perhaps a solid lung nozzle before we're comfortable saying that they're indeed stable and okay to, to ignore. Calcification is our next um, topic that we have to kind of discuss here. Um, we're probably aware that there are a number of internal um, calcification patterns within a nozzle that are pathognomonic for benignity. Um, however, we need to also understand that there are also internal calcification patterns within a nozzle that are indeterminate, not pathognomonic, but indeterminate for benignity versus um, malignancy in this case. Um, these particular image um, internal calcification patterns are important because we cannot sign these nozzles off as benign on first observation. And it's important to know what these patterns are and what they look like. Uh, one last note at the bottom of the slide, um, just be aware of osteosarcomas. Um, they're one malignancy that can exhibit a benign calcification pattern. Um, and so we have to know the patient's history. Um, it's important to know if a patient has osteosarcoma. Um, you don't want to be calling um, osteosarcoma, that's uh, calcified granulomas. So uh, calcification patterns um, fall into two groups. They're the ones that are pathognomonic for benignity. Um, these are the four types, diffuse, central, laminated, and popcorn calcification patterns. Um, the image on the left is a drawing I've made. The image on the right are actual CT images of an example. Um, diffuse calcifications, uniform, complete, um, same density calcification throughout the nodule. Central calcifications, uniform, same density calcification, dead center in the nodule. Laminated calcifications are targetoid. Popcorn calcifications are chunky, but all the calcifications are of the same density. 
the patterns we have to be careful about are these three. These are the indeterminate patterns where the calcification does not guarantee benignity. Um, we have an amorphous pattern where calcification varies in density. We have a stiff pattern um, composed of really, really fine little dots of calcification. And then we have an eccentric pattern uh, where we see one or a few uh, fo foci of calcification that are not dead center, but eccentric. Next topic, clinical history. Clinical history always matters. Um, why does it matter? Uh, smokers, um, for example, have a higher risk of malignancy than non-smokers. We need to know that information. Extra thoracic malignancies matter as well. Um, the chance of any um, non-specific nodule being cancer is substantially higher if the patient has a history of cancer elsewhere in the body. And then finally, uh, we have to be aware that there are other exposures that are um, tied to an increased risk for lung cancer. Uh, things like asbestos, radon, uranium, uh, uranium, especially in the military population, uranium exposure. So in summary, um, these are five characteristics that will influence our suspicion of malignancy. All right, so the larger something is, the higher our suspicion. With subsolid lung nozzles, we have to be careful. And also because when subsolid lung nozzles are, nozzles are malignant, they often tend to grow more slowly these tend to require longer surveillance than a solid nodule. Calcification matters too. Not every calcified nodule is benign. We need to know which ones are the ones we need to be careful about. Age matters. The older someone is, the higher our suspicion for any um, given nodule. It's pretty uncommon, for example, to see lung cancer in a 35-year-old. And finally, clinical history matters too. What risk factors for lung cancer exist for your patient that you're looking at? Does the patient have an extra thoracic malignancy? You'll notice that these are some of the inputs into um, guidelines such as the Fleischer Society guidelines or the Lung Rads guidelines. All right, so those are the, um, the main factors that come into play when people judge how suspicious to be about a lung nozzle and obviously what to do about them in terms of management. But uh, what is the management strategy? Um, our strategy for assessing and managing nonspecific nozzles and masses is divided into three buckets. Um, we're going to talk about um, how to handle um, nozzles and masses that are sub-centimeter. We're going to talk about how to handle nozzles that are in that one to three centimeter category. And then we're going to talk about how to handle masses. Masses are probably the easiest to discuss first, so that's where we'll start. The differential diagnosis for a nonspecific mass is uh, relatively easy to construct since unfortunately 94% of the time the answer is going to be malignancy. However, that means that doesn't mean that that's the only answer. So um, non-malignant um, um, entities you know, can sometimes be the cause of a mass, um, but this represents only 6% of masses. And some of the most common uh, explanations for a non-malignant mass uh, we've listed here. Uh, bacterial lung infection presenting as a phlegmon or an abscess or an endemic fungal infection um, are possible. Um, other things to think about that could present as a mass um, that's non-malignant. Um, what, uh, Wegner's, what we, used to, uh, what we used to call Wegner's disease, uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, GPA. And then there are two other um, diseases which I've asterisked because these are um, explanations for a lung mass that can be extremely uncommon or relatively common depending on your practice. So if you are working in a medical center seeing a lot of trauma, pulmonary hematoma is not an uncommon explanation for a lung mass. Um, and uh, our final um, entity here, if you're working in a place of say a lot of coal miners, um, a disease um, known as progressive massive fibrosis um, that's associated with uh, more end stage or advanced uh, uh, um, some pneumoconioses um, can also be an explanation for lung mass, but that requires you to work in an area where you're seeing that specific type of patient. And the next two slides are just examples of these six percenters. Here's a blastomycosis case and a case of GPA that presented as lung mass non malignant. Now, because we've established that in most cases, um, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the reason for the mass is going to be malignant, you know, that's 94% of the time. Um, pretty much the management is to embark on your oncologic workup immediately. Um, only when um, there's strong clinical reason to suggest that the patient's um, part of these non-malignant 6% group 
um, do we um, stray from that uh, pathway? Um, in that situation, uh, you're usually involving other um, services in their management of the patient because maybe you're dealing with phlegmon or endemic fungal infection or any of the other things on the list we just showed you. Um, in these cases, though, um, surveillance in terms of imaging is still um, pretty close. Um, we want to make sure we're not mistaking and missing a large lung cancer. So that's how we approach the management of masses. These are um, masses over three centimeters. Now, the other extreme are subcentimeter lung nozzles. If we look at the differential diagnosis for subcentimeter lung nozzles, um, it plays out very, very differently than for masses. Um, it's almost like the pie chart has reversed itself. Um, you know, as long as we're not talking about patients who have a known malignancy, uh, we expect that only about 1% of the time will the answer be a malignant um, diagnosis, um, a subcentimeter primary lung cancer or a subcentimeter lung metastasis. Overwhelmingly, 99% of the time, the answer is going to be something non-malignant. And uh, we're going to basically kind of, um, you know, encounter um, a number of, of explanations for a non-specific lung nozzle in daily practice. Um, some of the most common ones are a granuloma that hasn't calcified, a subcentimeter intrapulmonary lymph node, or nodular scar in the lung. Um, occasionally, we'll see other, um, you know, reasons for subcentimeter nodules or a nodule, um, lung infection presenting as uh, infectious bronchiolitis or bronchopneumonia pattern, and a smoking-related disease uh, known as Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which can sometimes present as subcentimeter nodules. Uh, what's kind of interesting is, is um, you know, um, you can kind of divide these um, subcentimeter non-malignant uh, nodule um, diagnoses in terms of uh, um, non-actionable and actionable um, causes non actionable ones being ones that we do nothing about, and actionable ones that require some sort of management, be it antibiotics or telling someone to stop, stop smoking. Um, entities such as the non-calcified granuloma, nodular scar, intrapulmonary lymph nodes tend to be on the lower subcentimeter um, side of the um, um, size um, range, and they tend to be fewer in number two, the meaning you'll see them on one image, and you may have to scroll a few more images to see another one. Um, Non-malignant explanations for subcentimeter nodules like lung infection and Langerhans um, tend to be on the larger side of the subcentimeter uh, nodule range. They tend to also be more numerous. You'll most often see multiple uh, nodules um, of this size on one image alone. And examples such as um, this case of bronchopneumonia or this case of histoplasmosis or these cases of Langerhans are examples. These are all subcentimeter nodules. Um, you can see that there's multiple um, on one image. The management of these subcentimeter lung nozzles um, is going to be primarily follow-up CT. Um, we've established that 99% of the time, the answer is going to be benign. Um, so um, the risks of subjecting many of these patients to biopsy um, would kind of not um, perhaps be wise. I and mean, also, for nozzles of this size, it'd be pretty difficult to, to, to actually stick a biopsy to. Um, now, the follow-up of these imaging uh, of, of these uh, nozzles may occur on different schedules and for different durations. And that's going to depend on some of the factors we discussed earlier that influence our suspicion for malignancy of a nodule. Things like the size of the nodule, the density of the nodule, and perhaps the patient history. Our goal here is primarily to uh, watch the nodule and hope it either goes away or maintains stability for a set amount of time and then be able to say, this is therefore benign. Um, oftentimes, the true etiology of these nodules is not quite known, but um, management is the same, leave alone. So we may not ultimately know if a four millimeter nodule was a nodular scar or a non-calcified granuloma, but in any event, uh, once we know it's not malignant, uh, we leave those alone. Now, the follow-up schedules and duration for these subcentimeter nodules um, is set um, differently depending on which one of three um, nodule follow-ups um, scenarios you're in. Um, the first scenario, which we refer to as an incidental lung nodule, is um, a situation where you've done a chest CT to answer a clinical question. Uh, does my patient have a PE or why are they short of breath? And while you're answering the question, you incidentally see a lung nodule. Um, in that situation, 
uh, follow-up schedule um, is determined by the Fleischer Society guidelines. Um, with Fleischer Society guidelines, the duration of follow-up ranges from zero to five years, depending on size and density and of a nodule and the patient's risk factors. In the second scenario, we call lung cancer screening. Uh, we're CTing asymptomatic people uh, and we're doing it specifically to look for a lung nozzle. So we're not answering some other question and happening upon a lung nozzle. We're actually going out of our way to purposely look for lung nozzles. The follow-up schedule in this case is not the Fleischner Society guidelines, but a different set of guidelines called the Lung RADS guidelines uh, created by the American College of Radiology. Um, the duration of follow-up in this case is different than the Fleischner guidelines. Um, they're a lot more open-ended. Um, pretty much uh, when you stop following up patients um, is usually um, basically determined by when the patient no longer meets eligibility criteria for lung cancer screening. Generally, that means you stop when the patient is now at least 15 years out from their last cigarette or they've reached the age of 80. The final scenario uh, we refer to as metastasis surveillance. Um, this is a situation where a patient has a known malignancy and we are imaging patients to look for metastases. Um, in this case, there is no set table um, like there is for incidental lung nodules or lung cancer screening. Uh, Follow-up schedules are determined primarily on our own clinical judgment as radiologists, clinical judgment of oncologists, um, or perhaps clinical trials in which a patient might be enrolled. And the follow-up duration for uh, metastasis surveillance generally is indefinite. So that's how sub-centimeter nodules are managed. So now we've talked about the management of masses, We've talked about the management of subcentimeter nodules. Um, that leaves um, the group in between here, uh, nodules that are nonspecific in that one to three centimeter uh, range. Um, these are particularly interesting because the probability of malignancy is not 1% and it's not 94%. It's somewhere in between and highly variable from patient to patient. And the number of diagnostic possibilities and the management for each of these goes off in multiple different ways. So a much, much more heterogeneous and larger group of diagnoses to consider. So what's our strategy here? Well, our strategy starts out with what are the potential causes we have to worry about when we see a one to three centimeter nozzle in a patient that's nonspecific. And in every single patient, we always will have to worry about a neoplastic cause. Um, that cause may be malignant, such as a primary lung cancer or a metastasis, um, or it can occasionally be a uh, non-specifically presenting benign neoplasm like a hamartoma. Okay, so that's always going to be in your differential diagnosis. Now, the differential diagnosis for a nozzle of one to three centimeters will potentially expand if your patient fits one of four important uh, clinical scenarios. These are the four clinical scenarios. Does your patient live in an endemic fungal infection region? Does your patient have an organ transplant? Is your patient at risk of seeding um, bacterial, lung, uh, bacterial infection through the bloodstream? Uh, patients with indwelling catheters or IV drug abusers are folks that we tend to think of first. And finally, um, is your patient an RA or an inflammatory bowel disease patient? If your patient has one of these, uh, fits into one of these four scenarios, suddenly um, we have to consider additional entities in our differential diagnosis for a one to three centimeter nodule. If your patient um, doesn't fit into any of these four clinical scenarios, they really have, unfortunately, no reason to have a nodule of this size unless it's a cancer, metastasis, or perhaps a hamartoma. So if I have a patient who lives in Ohio and has an organ transplant, my differential diagnosis, if I encounter a one to three centimeter nonspecific nodule in them, includes everything in blue, but also may include histoplasmosis, invasive aspergillosis, necardia, and PTLD. Um, there's two diagnoses on this list that are known to grow very quickly. And so if you happen to have imaging that shows the nodule wasn't there recently and suddenly it appeared out of the blue, um, you're going to be heavily um, uh, weighted towards thinking about invasive aspergillus and septic emboli. These are the two nozzles of that size that can grow very, very quickly. And the next couple images are just a selection of examples of um, nonspecific one to three centimeter nozzles um, in folks that, in this case, did not happen to be primary lung cancer, metastasis, or 
and non-specifically presenting hematoma. The management for these one to three centimeter nodules is not guided by any chart like the Fleischer Society guidelines or lung rads, but by um, basically our clinical judgment and our um, clinical skills as physicians. Um, our job as radiologists will be to offer our best guess and hopefully as narrow a differential diagnosis as possible. And in this case, um, generally um, referral to some subspecialist, whether it's infectious disease, pulmonary, uh, what have you, is generally um, uh, in, uh, required. Um, we can't look up the, say, Fleischer Society guidelines because, as we've established, these sort, of, these sort of diagnoses and these differential diagnoses are highly dependent on clinical history. And the Fleischer Society guidelines do not quite um, take into consideration all of these different potential histories and how to influence the management of each type of nodule. So we've gone through now um, basically how we approach building a differential diagnosis and some sort of strategy uh, for the uh, interpretation and management of nozzles and masses in the sub-centimeter, one to three centimeter, and greater than three centimeter um, um, size ranges. Um, before we conclude this talk, um, we wanted to share a few practical notes um, in terms of things that are important to know when working in the reading room every day, reading um, nozzles and masses. And these were conveniently summarized by the Fleischer Society a couple of years ago. And we're just going to go through them with you. Um, rules for assessing lung nozzles on imaging from the Fleischer Society, or I should say suggestions perhaps. Um, suggestions are uh, reviewing them on axle images that are 1.5 millimeters or thinner. Um, measuring nozzles using lung windows with a sharp kernel. Um, reporting the size of a nozzle to the nearest whole millimeter. Um, being explicit in terms of the location of a nozzle mass. It's not uncommon for us to provide an image number, for example, too, so that folks can actually know spe specifically what uh, nozzle we're sp um, speaking of. And lastly, um, size change, whether we're talking growth or perhaps shrinkage, um, is defined as a change of at least two millimeters in size. When it comes to measuring the size of nozzles, in this case, solid and ground glass lung nozzles, um, these are the guidelines the Fleischer Society introduces um, or um, recommends. Um, for nozzles that are less than three millimeters, we will not report a size number. We will just refer to these as micro nozzles. Um, you can choose to call these less than three millimeter micro nozzles in your report if you'd like, in case um, perhaps the reader of your report doesn't really know what a micro nozzle um, is in terms of size. For nodules that are three to 10 millimeters, the guidance from the Fleischer Society is to report the average dimension. And the way we draw the, we measure the average is to uh, measure the long axis first and draw a perpendicular, that's 90 degrees, um, short axis measurement and then taking the average. Okay. Um, and uh, for nozzles that are over 10 millimeters, we'll report both dimensions of a nozzle, even if the nozzle is circular. Um, it's important to remind ourselves that um, when we look up what to do with a solid or ground glass nozzle of a certain size on the Fleischner Society um, guidelines um, chart or the um, lung rads chart, um, the numbers that people use to decide what to do are the averages, not the long axis size of these nozzles, but the averages. That's why we're measuring and reporting these and because these are going to be the numbers we're going to use to look up what to do. Measurement of part solid lung nozzles is slightly a little bit more complex than for um, ground glass and solid lung nozzles because um, for a part solid lung nozzle where um, part of the nozzle may be solid and, and part of it's um, ground glass, uh, we're going to have to report not only the overall size of the nozzle using the same rules on the last slide, but we also have to measure the size of the solid component. And what we're going to report as the size of the solid component is not going to be the average. Um, this is where the rules are not entirely consistent, that, um, but we're going to uh, measure the maximal diameter. So we'll report the average for the overall size of the nozzle, but the maximum diameter for the solid component. And when we look up what to do on, say, the Fleischer Society guidelines or the um, Lung Rads guidelines uh, for part solid lung nozzle, the, the number of inputs are going to be average for the overall size 
maximum diameter for the solid size when you're looking up what to do on the chart. Guidance from the Fleischer Society, Society for measuring multiple lung nozzles is uh, relatively, um, I guess, um, uh, reasonable. Um, measure the largest and most suspicious nozzles. Juxtapleural nozzles are nozzles that um, exist along the fissures or along the margins of a lung. Um, juxtapleural nozzles that have a shape typical of an intrapulmonary lymph node require no follow-up according to the Fleischer Society. Um, these are nozzles that are triangular, flat, lens-shaped um, in, sh in shape. Um, in these folks, um, no follow-up is required per Fleischer Society guidelines. Um, we will, however, tend to follow up juxtapleural um, lung nozzles that have a size that doesn't look um, typical for an intrapulmonary lymph node, or obviously in people with a history of cancer. The final slide um, is the Fleischer Society's guidelines on what to do when you see an incidental lung nozzle when you're reading an abdominal or a neck CT, where only part of the lung um, has been um, captured. In a patient who has no history of cancer and a one to five millimeter incidental lung nozzle on one of these abdominal or neck CTs, the guidance is no further investigation. If that incidental lung nozzle on this neck or abdominal CT is 68 millimeters in size, the recommendation is, and you don't know it's been stable because you don't have a prior study, the recommendation is go look up the Fleischer Society guidelines and then ask for a chest CT at that indicated time. Uh, lastly, for incidental lung nodules over eight millimeters on a neck or abdominal CT, the recommendation is to get a chest CT now.